Welcome to my new RF lab on a budget. 2020 was a really bad year in many ways. However, in some ways it was actually very good. Uh, we've seen the Nano VNA come out and there's been a number of videos on this and I've done some myself. But in addition, there's this tiny SA or tiny spectrum analyzer that you may have heard about. This is like 55, 60 bucks, and I couldn't avoid buying it. I've done a series of videos concentrating on the Nano VNA. Those videos were focused on some performance of the Nano VNA and how to use it to understand capacitances and inductances and so forth. And you can also find plenty of other excellent videos on YouTube about the Nano VNA and about the Tiny SA and how to use these instruments. But our goal in this video is going to be a little different. We're going to use the Tiny SA and the Nano VNA to help illustrate how radio actually works. Now obviously that's a very aggressive goal and there's no way in a short video like this that we can explain in detail how radio works. However, uh, what we're going to be presenting today is walking through some of the test equipment that you can now buy for quite inexpensive prices and put together your own RF lab and design and build radio receivers, for example. This block diagram is actually from a course that I taught for a number of years at a university. In university settings, we have test benches laden with very expensive, very large, very heavy equipment. But the world has changed. In 2020, or thereabouts, I think it might have come out before, the Nano VNA came out, the Tiny SA came out, and things like this inexpensive oscilloscope back here, and meters and signal generators, these are all much more affordable now than they used to be. So for the first time, it's becoming possible to actually put together a laboratory that you can do things that were done in a classroom with expensive equipment, you can now do at home with very inexpensive equipment, comparatively speaking. So before we get started talking about how radio works and how you can figure that out using these new instruments, let me just walk you through some of what I've put together here on my little homebrew bench. There's the tiny SA that I just bought for, I think it was $55. Right here, I've got an external antenna hooked up to it, and it's sweeping from 0 hertz to 350 megahertz. What you see here is the FM broadcast band. This is some lower shortwave signals. It's midday, afternoon. Uh, this is actually from some leakage from this setup over here where I have a signal generator audio or low megahertz range hooked up and generating a pulse train. If I turn that off, then you can see that the noise out in the higher frequency range went away. Here, of course, we have the Nano VNA, and it is hooked up to do an S21 measurement and an S11 measurement, but the device under test is a little filter that I built on this test board that I was able to buy from Amazon for very inexpensive. That filter was designed using methods that we'll talk about in this video to be a bandpass shape. The blue line here is S21, and it's centered at about 95 megahertz, which is close to the center of the FM broadcast band. So those are my primary radio frequency tools. In addition to that, for lower frequencies, Let's say we build an FM receiver, like shown here in this block diagram, and we eventually end up with audio over here. We'll need something like this audio signal generator. This was about $70, and it goes up to about 20 megahertz, but it goes down to DC, actually. Also, an oscilloscope, this was $70, and it goes up, theoretically, to 100 megahertz. It's, it, realistically, it's good to 30 megahertz and above. And, of course, a multimeter. I did a video on this multimeter a while back, so you could take a look at that if you're interested. And finally, some parts. So over here is a kit that contains a large number of surface mount parts. It was like 50 or 60 bucks. This is a book that has a lot of surface mount inductors in it. They were not in that kit, so I bought that separately for a similar price. 
Um, here are some UFL connectors that are very nice for hooking up to the Nano VNA to a circuit board, such as this circuit board that's home designed. And various cables and connectors, such as these that some of them come with the Nano VNA or the Tiny SA. But you may also want to get some others. Uh, these are attenuators and DC blocks that can come in handy. And finally, this variable power supply is one I had on hand. I bought it at a ham radio flea market for about $30 a long, long time ago. It works great. So let's say we want to design an FM broadcast band receiver. What do we need to do? Well, we need some RF processing, and of course we need an antenna. And then ultimately we will need baseband processing, which includes demodulation and an amplifier and probably a speaker. From a radio perspective, the RF processing has to deal with everything coming into the antenna, and that includes the signal we desire from the FM broadcast transmitter, for example, and other stations, for example, or even things that are out of band. This spectrum analyzer right now is going from 0 hertz to 350 megahertz. The FM band is here. That's all we need to take into our FM receiver. So we could try to get rid of these lower frequencies and these higher frequencies. And we could do that using a bandpass filter. And that's what radios have done traditionally for over 100 years. Here, I have a bandpass filter that is designed on this little test board. And this bandpass filter is composed simply of an inductor and a capacitor, these two elements on the left here, to ground. The series element right here that goes from port 1 to port 2 on this test board is just a zero ohm resistor. The beauty of the Nano VNA is it allows us to check this filter after we've designed it, make sure that it actually does what it should do. And that's not an easy thing in RF circuits. As we've discussed in previous videos, things like inductors and capacitors have what are called parasitics, and their values are not exactly right. Plus, an inductor can actually turn into a capacitor at very high frequencies. And so in order to be able to deal with that, the Nano VNA helps us. So for example, here we're looking at the S21 curve, or the gain through the filter. The peak gain is shown here at marker 1, and it reads negative 3.7 dB at 95 megahertz. That's not terrible. This also shows us how much attenuation the filter offers out of band, how much signals that aren't part of the FM broadcast band centered around 95 or 98 megahertz will be attenuated. For example, at low frequencies, here, they're going to be attenuated by 30 or 40 dB. At high frequencies, similarly, although at very high frequencies, the response can come back up. And that's due to the parasitics in the components as discussed in a previous video. For example, at very high frequencies, the capacitor is supposed to short the signal out, but the capacitor has some serious inductance in it, and that's what causes the response to come back up. So the Nano VNA allows us to quantify those effects and see if our filter is going to work in practice. So let's actually put the filter together with the signal coming in to the tiny SA. We'll pre-filter the signal coming in. And that's what radios do. For example, this is a block diagram of a superheterodyne receiver. I scratched out the word modern because many modern receivers do not use the superhet design anymore. They use a direct conversion or zero IF architecture. But even still, they virtually always pre-filter the signals coming in to just the signals that they're interested in. And that's done with what's called a pre-select filter. This block diagram shows that high frequencies are attenuated, low frequencies are attenuated, and the center frequency in the band you're interested in is passed through from the antenna to, in this case, the low noise amplifier. We'll cover the rest of this later, but in brief, down here at the lower left, we have an example spectrum, sort of like what we just saw there on the tiny SA. There's some frequencies we don't want, there's the ones we do, other ones we don't want. What happens is those get filtered, and if we have an amplifier, which we do, and I'll show you later, uh, they will get amplified, 
and you'll have a spectrum that looks something like this. And we can check that with the tiny SA as we build our projects. And then there's usually another filter before the mixer, which converts the frequencies you're interested in down to lower frequencies, which are easier to process, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but this other filter does same as the first one, but it just does it a little better. So finally, you end up with something like this, where you have only the signals that you're interested in. So let's see if that works. Here is the spectrum with the interference from these signals and these signals. These are not actually signals. These are from my um, generator that's putting out a pulse wave. I can actually turn that off and they go away. So that's kind of cool. You can use a spectrum analyzer to look at RF interference in your environment. So now I'm going to take this filter off of the test setup with the nano VNA and I'm going to insert it in series with the antenna going into the spectrum analyzer. Nice. Look at that. The FM broadcast band is here, but the lower frequencies are gone and the higher frequencies are gone. And we're left with essentially what our block diagram illustration of a receiver design shows. We've got the band of interest here and nothing else. Now we can go further. I have an amplifier circuit that we designed a while back here. And that amplifier plays the role of the low noise amp here in this block diagram. Its purpose is to take the weak signals that we're trying to receive and increase them in amplitude before we move them into the mixer and downstream to other processing. In a previous video, we looked at this amplifier and measured its gain using the Nano VNA, found it to be about 15 dB, give or take a little bit. Depends on the power supply voltage used. So when we insert our amplifier into this chain, letting this filter be the pre-select filter, and then the amplifier has a tune circuit in it as well, and that will act as the image filter. Let's see what we get over here. And here's the result. The signal is now minus 13 dBm. And the other signals in the FM broadcast band that flank it are also bigger, of course. Now, notice that there are some interesting new signals here. What are those caused by? Well, if you look at them, you may notice that they're at about twice the frequency of the FM broadcast band and about three times, and that may give a hint. What may be happening is this low noise amplifier might be going into saturation and somewhat clipping the signal and producing harmonics. Or it could be the tiny SA itself that's producing those harmonics. To figure out which, let's bring up the tiny SA menu and I'm going to change the attenuation setting. There's an attenuator and I previously set it to 0 dB. I'm going to set it to 10 dB. Look at that. Now this didn't change because the tiny SA knows that it's got 10 dB attenuation so it adjusts for that before it displays the result to you. What did happen however is the second and third harmonics the third harmonic is completely gone, the second is virtually gone, and so that tells me that the problem is overloading the tiny SA. Large spectrum analyzers, big expensive ones, also can be overloaded. You always have to worry about those sorts of things. When you're taking measurement, make sure what you're seeing is real. So I'm going to wrap this video up here by going over this block diagram once again and all the way to the output here. You can use the tiny SA to measure things inside a receiver if you're careful. I would not do this on a high voltage receiver like an old tube based receiver. And you'd also have to be very careful about not shorting circuits out. And of course, overloading the tiny SA could become a problem. And so what I've got here is a piece of coax that I bought that has a male SMA connector and a female SMA connector and I've stuck a little resistor in here. I had to put a little solder on the end of it to make it fit in the hole well and stay in the hole. And then I've put a piece of wire here clamped down by this nut that comes out to the same general location as that end of that resistor. This is a 4.7K resistor. So this resistor looks into the coax and at the other end is a 50 ohm termination. And so the 4.7K is driving into 50 ohms and it's a 40 dB attenuating probe. You might also consider getting a DC block.
Uh, again, don't do stuff with high voltage circuits uh, like tube amps, but with um, solid state amps, this DC block can prevent DC from getting into the tiny SA. Could save it from getting destroyed. So what's the rest of this block diagram? This is the spectrum we had coming in. We pre-selected primarily the FM broadcast band. We saw how well that worked. We amplified it. And then the final spectrum looked like this. Then there's a mixer. It takes the high frequencies. We'll call this nominally 100 megahertz. It mixes it with a slightly lower frequency, 77 to 97 megahertz. And that drops the signal down to a frequency in the 10 megahertz range. Then there'll be an IF filter, and that IF filter might be something like this. This is the RF demo kit for the Nano VNA that we've shown in a previous video. It should have a response that peaks at 10.7 megahertz and attenuates things outside of about a 200 kilohertz wide bandwidth. So that's what is here. And what that does is it takes the spectrum up here that has many signals, only one of which will be at 10.7 megahertz, and it filters all these other signals, um, and then the, only the desired signal is left, as shown down here, at 10.7 megahertz. That signal is then amplified, and finally you get a spectrum that looks like this. It is an FM signal. That means it's frequency modulated. The audio that they're trying to convey is conveyed by changing the frequency a little bit. Let's take a quick look at that by zooming in with the tiny SA. So here I have recentered the tiny SA sweep to 96.3 megahertz, which is the frequency of this largest signal. Got 25 megahertz span, so we essentially have the FM broadcast band here slightly shifted up. And now I've changed the span to 2 megahertz, and you can see the frequency modulation on the signal. It's centered here, but it's moving back and forth in sync with the audio voltage to convey the audio information to the FM receiver. If I span out a little bit, we can see a couple of other signals. Let's change this to a 4 megahertz span. And here's other stations. And finally, I have recentered at 103.5, which is a station in my area that has digital high definition audio channels as well as an analog channel. The analog channel is here in the middle. These, what looks like sidebands, are actually two auxiliary digital channels, digital high def FM radio. Notice the signal is quite a bit weaker than the others. That's one of the challenges of designing radio receivers. We have to receive very weak signals as well as very strong signals. And that's, of course, the reason we need amplifiers, but also filtering. So in our next video, we're going to see how to design those filters. And that brings in something very important in radio design called Q, or quality factor. These are some slides that I put together for that next video. So what's Q good for? We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the physics definition of Q. And then finally, we'll look at the actual circuit design that was used in what we saw today. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it.